I wish I could say that I'm always right with God. I mean, that would be wonderful, right? I'm the perfect Christian. I never do anything wrong. I'm always right with God. I never get cold-hearted. I never get upset. I never blah, blah. No, but see, none of these things are true. And, and if we're really honest, they're not true for any of us. Uh, we don't have any super Christians in here, okay? We've got a whole bunch of super sinners uh, that are hopefully here to meet with a super Savior, okay? And so I love this song because it talks about, uh, well, it just talks about, can I? I'm, I'm going to go to okay, folks. <clears throat> it just talks about uh, asking God to, to do something that only he can do. You know, uh, I, can, I, can, I can pump myself up for things. You know what I'm saying? You ever been to a, like a sporting event, right? And you can go there and sometimes just the electricity that's going on. Um, but, you know, I, 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 can, I can encourage myself in the Lord, right? I can. But there's sometimes I just don't, I don't have it. You know what I'm saying? I don't have it. I can't encourage myself in the Lord. And so you know what? And, and I found this to be very true. It's, it's pretty much next to impossible for me to, to praise him without him. I mean, because I don't have it in me. And so I like this. This is just turning to God saying, Lord, I need you to breathe life into me. Breathe life into me. <clears throat> Hold on. <laughs> I get the 6-8 time in my head. Restore in me joy of my salvation. Take me back to where it all began. Where all I ever wanted was your presence. How I long to be there once again light a fire that the world can't burn out fan the flame so nothing between us remains my life is an altar to you breathe again on the embers that burn in my heart love taken back to the store my life is an altar to you renew in me a pure and willing spirit take me back to where it all began before it all became so complicated how I long to be there once again light a fire that the world can't burn out fan the flame till nothing between us remains my life is an altar to you Breathe again on the embers that burn in my heart. A love taken back to the stars. My life is an altar to you. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. For when I've gone cold. Lord, I need you, how I need you, to awake my soul. Light a fire that the world can't burn out, fan the flame, till nothing between us remains. My life is an altar to you. Breathe again on the embers that burn in my heart. A love taken back to the start. My life is an altar to you. God, I'm sorry. 
Please forgive me for when I've gone cold. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you to away. Father, Lord, it is my desire, Lord, and I hope the desire of many here, Lord, for you to come right now, Lord, and just breathe life into us, Lord. We need you, Lord. Lord, I, it's just been good hearing your people praise you, praise your person, praise what you've done, praise you, Lord. Now, Lord, we need to hear from you, God. Lord, I'm unworthy. Lord, I've got no business, Lord, telling anybody what to do. Lord, you've placed me here, Lord, at this point, at this time, Lord, to do what only you can do. So I pray, God, you would use me. Lord, I pray for each heart here. Lord, I don't know hearts, God. I barely know my own. But, Lord, you know those that are struggling. Lord, those that, Lord, don't even know you yet. And I pray that today, Lord, you would do what only you can, and we'll give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, I tell you, you guys sang great today. That was awesome. I I got I, I love I love a good worship service. I like a good just a, a people that are just happy to to know the Lord and and I hope that's you this morning. I hope you're one that is just happy to know the Lord this morning. Let's take our Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We've been going through the the early acts of the church, uh, the acts of the early church for. Oh, it's been probably a year now. I don't know. I have to look back, but I don't. I don't rush through these things. Uh, even if I tried to, I wouldn't do a very good job of rushing through them. So, uh, um, I, I like. I like to look at the Word of God. I, listen, I want to encourage you today. Maybe you don't have that type of relationship with God yet. You, you're not seeking Him uh, for, on your own. Uh, getting into the Word of God, asking the Spirit of God to talk to your heart. I want to encourage you today. You know, there's nothing like it for the child of God. There's nothing like it. There's nothing that will bring you what only the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can bring you. Your faith will never be strong without the Word of God. Your emotions will always be something you wrestle with without the Spirit of God. And our, our personalities, all these things can come into, well, perspective and into the view of Christ as we look at His Word. So let's, uh, let's look at this together now. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment. He said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus. One that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set, thee, set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city." And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, 
If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would I that I should bear with you. But if it be question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. Agileo cared for none of these things. Our text is in verse 6. And I'm going to read that again. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. I want you to understand something. God called Paul to the Gentiles when God saved him on the Damascus Road. Y'all remember when Paul got saved, or Saul of Tarsus got born again when he met Jesus Christ face to face and Jesus confronted him with his sinfulness and Jesus confronted him with salvation. Paul turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and became a child of God. When he was supposed to go search out, search out a particular disciple by the name of Ananias, Paul went and Ananias was called by God to tell Paul how to be a Christian, how to follow Christ. And one of the things that God told Ananias is, I have separated him. He has a special purpose. I want him to go to the Gentiles. Now, whether Ananias told that to Paul or not, I'm sure that he did. Paul was always going to Gentiles because that was an unheard of thing. Peter was the first to do it early in Acts. We read that long, you know, quite a while ago. We went through that portion. And so Paul was now the one that God wanted to go to the Gentiles, okay, and to tell them about Jesus Christ. And so Paul was called by God to go to the Gentiles. Yet every instance that we have seen Paul, every time so far in the book of Acts, when he goes into a city, where does he go? He goes to the synagogue. Now, I want you to know something. The synagogue is not where the Gentiles are. The synagogue is where the tradition-observing Jude Judaism religion was being pursued and taught, where people were actively denying the person of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, Paul loved his people, all right? Paul loved that he was a Jew. He loved that he was, at one point in time, had been a Pharisee. And so he had a heart for his people. It's like, look, when I first got saved, I started telling my people, all right? By my people, the people in my life, the people that I was, that, that were in my life every day, the, my family, my friends, I started telling them, okay? But it can't, it couldn't stop there. God had other things for us to do. But God had Paul to go to the Gentiles, but we see every time. And sure enough, here he is. I mean, when he went to Athens, he even found a synagogue in Athens. Although there was a lot less of that there, here he goes to Corinth, another place in Macedonia, and he finds a synagogue. He left Athens. Silas and Timothy, who had called for to come to Athens, never did get to Athens. They were still uh, where they had been before. And so Paul now arrived at Corinth and found Aquila, an Italian Jew, and his wife Priscilla. They had left Rome. The Bible tells us there they left Rome because... Rome didn't want any Jews in their town. So here they are, they're in Corinth. And they were tent makers. And I like to see that Paul was a bivocational preacher. Listen, it's, it's, I think it's good. Uh, it could just because it's my, only my perspective, really. Since I've been pastor, I've had at least one other job, okay? And, and, and I think it's good because, uh, I mean, otherwise, I'd probably weigh a whole lot more because <laughs> if I didn't stay busy, whoo, pastors can snack. Okay, let me tell you the best pastor snack right here, okay? Popcorn, Pepsi Zero, peanut butter cups. That's it right there. That's perfect pastor snacking. And boy, you give me time, and I'll justify a reason to go get those things, sit down in front of a TV and do it, okay? So, I, I, and I, I say all that, look, I think it's good for a pastor to have something he can do. And Paul obviously had a trade, and it was being a tent maker. And so he worked with them as he ministered. He joined their occupation. Now, Paul continued to go and reason at the synagogue with Jews and Greeks. Now, I want you to understand something. Paul was going there, and he was reasoning with them. He was looking at the Old Testament and talking to them. And I believe, even though the Scripture doesn't say it because this is Paul's practice, I believe he's going there, and he's trying to get them to see in the Old Testament the prophecies of Messiah. He was reasoning with them about it. But he had not yet just plain out said that Jesus Christ was Messiah. He hadn't done that yet. We know this because he, they hadn't gotten mad at him yet. Because it seemed like every time he went to synagogue and started saying those things, people get upset. 
So Silas and Timothy, they get there to where he's at. They arrive and Paul makes a spirit-led presentation of the gospel of Jesus to the Jews. He feels stirred again. And it's time to talk about Jesus. So all those that have been reasoned with, however long it was before Silas and Timothy got there, here he is. He's reasoning with them. And now he says, you know what? I'm done just trying to, 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 to coddle you up to this point. Look, straight up, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is the one that loved you, died for you, and lives for you because he rose again the third day. And he completely tells them the gospel. Now, the Bible tells us there that most of the Jews opposed themselves and blasphemed. Now, let me tell you, we can think, we, we, we get this blaspheme thing, and, and maybe you don't, okay? I know growing up, I had this idea of what blaspheme was or what I thought it was, and it was just simply saying the Lord's name in vain, okay? Now, that's, that's really a, 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 an oversimplification of really what it is, because it is taking the Lord's name in vain. It is, but not... Like, and I'm going to say this, and don't let me get upset. It's not, oh my God. Okay, that's not what it's talking about. All right. How many of you, and I, I've used this illustration before, but because it's the best illustration works in my mind. How many of you have ever been somewhere, and somebody comes up to you, and they need something from you, and one of the first things they say to you is, I'm a Christian. Am I the only one? Really? Do I have something on my head that says, come up and bum something for me or something? I don't know. You ever, you ever been there where somebody says, hey, I'm a, I'm a hey, let me talk to you a second. First off, it's okay, I'm a Christian. You know, I, I gotta be honest, when somebody tells me that, the first thing I do is go, shield up. Right, why? Because I'm probably gonna be a little suspect as to who that person is. Let me say this. Blaspheme is denying who God is. It's not taking his name in vain, it's denying who he is. Now, when you couple those two things together, because really, if we're gonna get into the full parameter of what it's talking about, it is talking about taking his name in vain, but denying who he is. Okay? Like this. Telling people you're a Christian, but not following Christ in all your life. Not actually surrendering to him for salvation. Not actually surrendering to him with your life whatsoever. See, the Bible says God will not hold him blameless that does that. What does that mean? Well, there's only one sin that's going to send you to hell. Just one. It's not murder, it's not lying, it's not stealing, okay? It's, it's none of those things. It's not adultery or fornication. It's not homosexuality or the LGBTQ world in any way. It's denying who God is. It's denying who Jesus Christ is. If you leave this life without accepting the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day, then you unfortunately are dead in your sins. You unfortunately now have no hope. You unfortunately are going to have to answer for all of the sins because you didn't take care of that one sin. Because Jesus Christ died for all sins. The only sin that he can't die for is the one that doesn't believe he died for all sins. I'm hoping I'm making sense here. And so these Jews who said they knew who God was, Jehovah, uh, Elohim, uh, El Shaddai, El, and I can't even remember, El Kankana. I mean, there's so many God names in Hebrew. And, and, and they say they know who he is, and yet they don't know who he is. And we talked about that last week about the unknown God. And it is a tragic thing for someone that might be sitting here to say they know God, but they don't really know him. It's tragic. Because God is right there. He wants you to know him. He's not far we talked about all that last week, and I'm not going to re-preach last week's message, but these were opposing themselves, and they blasphemed. Do you understand that if you deny the existence of God, the only one you're hurting is you? The Bible says that you're holding with the cords of your sin. You're opposing yourself. Now, I've only done it a couple of times because y y y I, I, have a, I have a... I have kind of a bad sense of humor, and by bad I mean twisted, okay? Um, I know there's some of you that will agree with me that Fail Army has some of the best videos out there, right? I love watching people get messed up, okay? I, I just do. As long as it's not me, okay? As long as I'm not the one going through the physical trauma, I'm okay. It's funny. And you ever seen those people that have those, those bands, and they, the, the band's attached to the wall, and they step in it, and they're... Resistance bands, right? You know what I'm talking about? You guys ever seen those? Yeah. But I've seen too many videos where somebody's doing that resistance band and it, 
it, it lets go or breaks or something like that. And it falls, so I won't do those, okay? But, but you know, that's called a resistance bit. Why? Because it's going to oppose the direction that you want to go. It's going to stop you from doing what it is that you want to do. It's going to, or what you need to do. It, it's something that is, well, in opposition. You know, when you believe you're 100% right, you're pretty much not going to be reasoned with. That's why it's 99% of the arguments my wife and I have because we both think we're 100% right and neither one of us can hear that we're not. <laughs> Those Jews that could not see Christ as Messiah could not see it because one of the most blinding sins is that of self-righteousness. You know what Paul does though? Paul got in the flesh. He did. Look at our verse, verse 16. Let me have that verse, Jim. Look at our verse there. Or not in verse 16, I'm sorry, let's go, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, my bad. After verse 16, or verse 6, that is. Oh, no, he did say it. Your blood, I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, and I will go into the Gentiles. Now, you might be like, well, he's right, which he is. He is right. Paul got in the flesh, though, when he told him off. He got angry. Their blood was upon them. Listen, if you die and go to hell, it's not your mom's fault, your dad's fault, brother's fault, sister's fault, your boss's fault, your friend's fault, your cousin's fault. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. So Paul was right. Paul hadn't done anything wrong to them. He hadn't done them wrong. He wasn't doing it. He was trying to do them right. Paul was doing what he was supposed to do. So Paul was clean. He was not responsible. You're only responsible for the blood of those that enter into hell that you did not tell when you had the chance to. So he was clean. And Paul was called to the Gentiles. You know, you can say two true things, but in the wrong spirit. Sometimes we call it preaching. <laughs> I've done it. I've gotten up here and let her rip, but in the wrong spirit. It can be a difficult thing to feel that the opposition is yours. When somebody tells you, listen, I don't like somebody to oppose me. Like if I have one view and they have a different view, this is another thing that my wife, when we get in arguments, <laughs> she's opposing me and I don't like to be opposed. I want no friction. I want to be able to go forward and nothing stop me. It can be a difficult thing to feel that that opposition, when you're telling someone about Christ and they reject him, it can be difficult to not take it personally. I understand kind of what Paul was going through. You know, for a while there, we kind of stopped having altar calls. And I'm going to be honest with you, you, I think I said this early on, but we weren't having them because I was making them about me. I would preach a message, and if you didn't respond the way that I thought you should respond, then I took it personally. And I'll be honest with you, I used to get angry with people. Why? Because I thought the opposition was mine. I thought it was about me. Often when we think that the opposition that people give us, we're trying to show them Christ, makes us feel as though we have to fight, like we're supposed to defend the truth or do something. You know, God doesn't need me to fight for him. <laughs> he needs me to quit fighting with him. But this fight of those that oppose God, it belongs to God and he alone can fight it. They're not my opposition. The only one really that gets in the way of me and God is me. I'm my opposition. It helped Paul to learn a valuable lesson that he was taught, teaching Timothy and he reminded Timothy of in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. What an odd thing for Paul to bring up in his letter to Timothy here. I don't think in an accident. I think Paul knew that his response here was wrong. And one of Timothy did not make the same mistake. He says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. 
when we're trying to show someone Christ and they reject it and we respond with who we are, how's that going to show them who Christ is? How's that going to reveal to them the love of Christ? Listen, I know, I know that God is a holy, righteous, judgeful God. He is going to judge sin. Are you listening? He is going to judge sin. Here's the thing. In Christ, you don't have to worry about that. In Christ, there's no sin to judge because it was judged in Christ. So you know what Paul does? He goes and joins himself to a Gentile by the name of Justice. And we read about it. Justice, the Bible says, lived hard against the synagogue. That means he lived next door. Now, using a lot of these cities, they used stone and they might have shared a stone wall. Okay? But anyways, he lived close to the synagogue. Justice was a worshiper of God. He had a great testimony there in Corinth. And Justice was host to Paul's preaching near the synagogue. Now, understand, Paul was staying with Aquila and Priscilla, but this was kind of, this was kind of cool. All right? So here he is. He's been run out of the synagogue, again, out of another synagogue. But there's a guy that lives right next door to the synagogue. Now, here's the thing. He can't go to the synagogue and tell them about Jesus. He can't. They've run him out. They've opposed themselves. They've blasphemed. They've denied the existence of Christ. So you know what God does? God gives him a guy who lives right next door to the synagogue. So you know what he can do? Be right there by the synagogue and preach to the Gentiles and the Jews are still hearing. It's kind of hardcore, isn't it? <laughs> That's kind of neat. He couldn't go to the synagogue. The Gentiles, who had not been converted to Judaism, couldn't go to the synagogue. And those opposing still had to hear the gospel of Christ. They had to watch. And you, 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 you know, you want to see a, a Jewish person who believes that God is it and they're waiting on the Messiah. You want to show them, or you want to see them get really, really upset. Have them watch the Spirit of God move on somebody that's not a Jew. Have them watch. You want to see somebody that's really stuck in their self-righteousness get upset. <laughs> somebody who just... They've got it all figured out. They're doing right. They are right. And you're not. And they want you to know it. You want to see them get real upset? You just let God work in your life. You let God do something in your life. And you watch, watch them just get irate with what's going on. You know what happened? The chief ruler of the synagogue, Crispus, Still hearing the gospel of Christ. The one who knew the scriptures probably better than everybody else in that particular synagogue. And he kept hearing Paul preach at Justice's house about Jesus. You know, the Bible says he got saved. He accepted Christ and his house. He got saved. I imagine he probably got kicked out of the synagogue after that too. And many believed because Crispus turned to him. And it's amazing. It's amazing what God can do if one person just turns to him. One person can have such an, a ripple effect on so many lives. And God used Paul and justice to reach Crispus. Then Paul gets a vision. God says, let me say, Paul's gotten used to the fact that after a couple months, he's got to move again. He's gotten used to the fact after a couple years, I mean, he, he got to stay at Ephesus for a little while when they started that and in Philippi for a little bit. But he's gotten used to getting run out of town now. I mean, it's pretty much everywhere he goes, he gets run out of town. The Lord comes to him in a vision and says, don't be afraid. Speak loud and speak often. I'm with you. And I got a lot of people here that are with me. So Paul continued there for a year and a half teaching God's word. So for a year and a half, I think Justice's house was the epicenter for the gospel of Christ being preached to the church that was being started here at Corinth. But then came the predisposed to oppose. This Jewish crowd. They tried to use man's law and judge. Galileo was the judge there in the town. And they tried to convince Galileo that Paul was doing unlawful things. Galileo was not a Christian. Okay, but Galileo was a smart guy. And he says, listen here. This had got nothing to do with our law. 
or the law of the land. This is on you. You guys take care of it. You know what the Jews do? And this is just, this, this is just, this is an old school thing. This isn't, how many of you, how many of you have ever seen somebody that really is just trying on social media to, to, to give out Christ? Yeah? And maybe you got, it's things I look for, okay? And, and, and I look for somebody, you know, that is really trying to, uh, to, to, to proclaim what God is doing. I, I'm going to bring a, I'm going to bring a, 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 now I'm struggling with his name. Oh my word. Famous rapper, hip hop artist that got saved a few years back. Kanye West. Thank you. I don't know who said it, but good job. You heathens. No, I'm just kidding. Kanye West got saved a few years back. Okay. Now I don't, I didn't know who Kanye was. I mean, I heard of him. Okay. But I couldn't tell you who he was or any songs that he sung. And that don't make me anything. That just means I'm old and don't know who Kanye is, okay? But I heard this Kanye got saved, and he put out this Christian album. Let me tell you something. It was horrible, okay? Not as in, you know, oh, you shouldn't listen to that. No, it was just like really bad because he didn't know what he was doing. But, man, was he trying, man. He was trying. And he was on social media, and he tried. He, I, know, I know this. He was married to Kim Kardashian, and okay, I do know who that is, okay? Because, oh, my word, what is wrong with us, Okay? What is with as society, okay? Seriously, we have issues. But anyways, he was married to Kim Kardashian. And I happen to know for a fact that Kim Kardashian uh, uh, believes herself to be a fashion icon and that her fashion is to be mostly without any clothes on, okay? Modesty is not in her fashion. And I know uh, that there were reports that her and Kanye started getting up in arguments and maybe one of the things that on set them to not be together anymore is he wanted her to start dressing a different way. Because he believed that if we're going to honor God, then we ought to be modest. And so Kanye was really trying. And you know what happened to Kanye as he was really, really trying? He started to get attacked. I mean, I, I'm not kidding. I, I saw preachers, preachers that I know, that went off. There's no way this man's saved. There's no way. Same thing with Justin Bieber, okay? Listen, Justin Bieber's done some songs with Maverick City and, and Bethel and some different stuff that is some... Really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah, he still sings his other songs too. But he's somebody else that I've watched as they've tried. And when somebody that's really self-righteous sees somebody that is just really trying, right from where they're at, because guess what? We don't get saved and become super Christians. Okay? We don't. But those self-righteous people would see that, and they just started going off. Ripping them. Telling there's no way God's going to use that stuff. There's no way God can be in that. And... Man, it's so sad to see people who are the farthest from God think they know who he is and then have to bring people down who are trying. And justice was just trying. Justice got in trouble. Soth scenes got in trouble. The Jews, see the Jews, they have to have a good testimony. You understand that? The Jews that are following Judaism, they have to have a good testimony. And there's things they can't do. Okay? Not and continue to be a good Jew. So you know what they did? They got some Greeks. Now, not just any old Greeks. These are proselyted Greeks. Now, let me explain what that is. That's a big word. I don't use proselyted all the time, okay? These are Greeks that had turned from whatever they were serving and were worshiping Jehovah God of the Old Covenant. They were converted to Judaism. But they didn't have the same rules, apparently, that the Jews did. And so the Jews said, here, we can't do it because it'll look bad if we do it. But you guys, you go get this Sosthenes and you go beat him. This is Paul's friend. You can go to 1 Corinthians and see that he was friends with him. Another chief ruler of a different synagogue, maybe. Or maybe when, uh, uh, when, when Crispus got saved, he stepped into place and then he got saved. I don't know, but another chief ruler, someone else who knew the word of God. And Paul called him a friend, a brother. But Sothenes got beat there in Acts. I want to take a few minutes here and look at those with this predisposition of opposition. Predisposed is having or showing an inclination or a tendency toward a specified condition, opinion, behavior, or matter beforehand. That means you're going into a situation fully with what you know or what you think you know, and you're not going to change the way that you know. And then to oppose is to act against, to resist, either by physical means or arguments or other means. So these are those that are pretty much settled in their mind that they're going to fight whatever it is they're stepping into. 
So I, I've got some other pre's that I want to talk about that kind of go along with this predisposition of opposition. And I hope that you don't fit in the category of any of these pre's here at church today. There are those that are predetermined. They come to church planning to leave the exact same way. You're going to come, but you're going to go. You're here. They won't be swayed by any song, by any sermon, or any spirit. They'll leave the exact way they came. There's the predetached. They're here, and that's all that God's going to get. They feel God only requires their attendance. And they do not feel the need to interact in any type of serving, in fellowship, or in any worship. There's the predesensitized. Flash, flood, or fiery flame, they will not be moved. They've seen it all, and nothing ever lasts, so why try? You know, calluses cover any scars. That way they don't get hurt again. Man, I know a lot of people that are in that pre. They tried really hard to serve God. It didn't work out the way they thought it was. The way they thought it should. And so, they just kind of just put a wall up between them and God. They're just not going to let anything really touch them. There's the pre-developed. <laughs> They're the most spiritual person here. So they have no need of what the Spirit might provide today, and the message is actually for someone else. There's the pre-depressed. These are stuck thinking that joy unspeakable is simply joy unseekable. They are too focused on how they feel to allow the comforter to show them just how powerful he really is. God is good, just not to me. There's the predeceased, those that are dead in their sins. And they don't seem to care that Christ has offered life everlasting. They're too busy consuming what they need, like a zombie, unwilling to allow anyone who is life to give them life. You know, those that have opposed themselves, they're not doing it on purpose. Every one of those conditions, it's not an on purpose, it's, it's, it's a pre genetic disposition. You know, every one of you in here are born with a pre-genetic disposition. Every one of us. We're all sinners. The Bible says, whereas by sin, whereas by uh, uh, sin, one man, in, whereas by one man sin entered into the world, so as sin entered into the world, death by sin. We're all born into sin. You are pre-genetically disposed to oppose the things of God. Now, we talked about all these different pre's, and I don't know which one, you might fit into, but it's just part of a sin nature. I love what Paul told Timothy, and this is for me, okay? Don't strive with them. Be gentle, apt to teach, patient and meek, and let God bring them around. Here's the thing. I don't know what pre you might be. I just know this. You just keep listening. <laughs> I ain't going to fight you. and You're not fighting me. You're not fighting me. But you're fighting someone who loves you more than you could ever possibly know in this life. You're not opposing me. You're opposing God. You might be sitting here right now and you've already determined that nothing is going to change your mind. I'm not your enemy. More importantly, God is not your enemy. And you're the only one you're hurting right now. But that can change. You just got to lay down all your preconceived ideology. Come to the one who decided over two millennia ago that he was going to pre-pick you. <laughs> now listen, <laughs> I'm not into a whole predestination thing where God picks and chooses who gets saved. I don't believe that to be biblical. But I am saying right now, and without a shadow of a doubt of being contradicted, God chose you long before you were ever here. He pre-picked you because he loves you. He determined long ago that you were worth 